<laughs> All right, cameraman Wes. Yeah. Here we are, man. We're in the new and improved studios. I know, here it looks really good, doesn't it? Here at the Steel Horse Thunder Cafe, man. Looking pretty good the way they, they got things set up for us now. Mm -hmm. Truly digging the new setup. Um, before we go on, I, we have a special guest here. We do. Today, and I am, I've am i been stoked about this one. I've been <laughs> right. very excited about this one. Um, he's, just, he's just a super cool dude to begin with. Yeah. Um, but then on top of that, once you learn more and more about him and, and what he has done, Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I, I believe everybody kind of gets, you get something unique that you get to do and, and it kind of gives you a little bit of a an oomph or, or maybe a platform or <laughs> yeah. whatever you want to call it. Right. And most people never take advantage of that. No. And then there's some that do. And when they, and they do it and they stay humble and they stay you know the same person they were before everything right. and it's just when you meet those kind of people that's when you know you found somebody genuine and somebody really cool so yes. i'm super stoked to have him on here yes but uh, i do know you've got a uh, badass beard care that's right sponsoring this show and i want you to tell the people a little bit about badass beard care right and what they can do to save money yes and make uh, money <laughs> see yes badass Great. beard care they are a veteran-owned company uh, all American made products and most of the, you know most of their profits go back into helping veterans in some way or form so when you're purchasing anything your money is going back to help veterans nice so that's pretty cool um, I wear their beard oil all the time It's the best beard oil I've ever used uh, I actually just ordered some deodorant because they do deodorant cologne all kinds of stuff that I didn't even realize um, but if you use the link that is in the description for this episode, uh, that link takes you to their website. And when you go to the checkout screen, you put in Steel Horse as the discount code. That gives you 10% off your, your purchase. And it also gives us a commission. Nice. So when you purchase from that, uh, that link in the dis description, you save money and we get money back from it right on so it's a win-win win-win it yep. is a win-win all right man well you know i don't, I don't want to take up any more time right. i want to get this man in here this is probably the hardest working individual oh yeah i've ever met <laughs> definitely and, and yes. i honestly I, I don't know that anybody could ever argue that no you know what i mean i mean they could but they'd be foolish because right they're, they're, they'd be stupid <laughs> so uh without further ado what do you say we go get him. I, I heard he was out playing in the creek out there. So <laughs> yeah. let's get him out of the creek and let's get him over here to this table. Let's do it. Oh, man. I'll tell you what, though. Uh, it, Rupert, it's great to have you on here. Let me just say that first. Yes. I, this is something, you know, we don't get to hang out all the time, but we, we usually bump into each other a couple times, at least two or three times a year. We get to, we get to spend a little bit of time together. It's always in the midst of a motorcycle uh, ride, it's or it's the motorcycle expo, and we got thousands of people at the expo. You got hundreds of people at the the rides, and it gets a little crazy. Mm -hmm. It gets a little hectic. Uh, so to be able to just sit down here at the table and hang out with you, um, this this is this is just fantastic. I appreciate that you asked. I appreciate all the times that you've shown up. Years, you know. I mean. For years, we had the Beach Grove ride. That made right. it eight years before it finally the bar. But you were coming out there for that one. Yes. Uh, the Indianapolis ride that made it for years. The Lafayette ride that is now that just that 17th. Last year, next year will be the 18th. On the 23rd of August, that I think it's the third Saturday in August, already scheduled for the 18th annual 18th. ride. Uh, and this last year with only 50 some bikes and we won't say the number they generated eleven thousand dollars wow see that's that's the amazing thing here, here, here um numbers on a ride have been declining yes for quite a while yes it, it's not the same as it was 20 years ago as numbers of rides are increasing still exactly but, exactly yes. and that's the thing back in the day 18 years ago, when your ride was going on, there was not another ride anywhere else going on on that same day. Right. Now we go on a Saturday, and I'm looking, it's like I have 20 rides to choose from as to what we're going to go cover that week. Mm -hmm. It's nuts. And so, therefore, numbers come down. And I'm blown away, though, how the money hasn't 
dropped. I look at the Miracle Ride. They kind of did the same thing. They had to kind of back downsize right. and everything else. But you know, when it went to an all volunteer staff, there was less motorcycles coming out. And even though they didn't make as much money, they actually were able to donate more each year yes. because there wasn't. Your expenses are You down. no longer had. Right. You You're know, not trying to staff did, something all year long. Yeah, you didn't have for twenty full time employees and all that. And years ago, you could you could get away with that because there were not so many rides. And right. I've been on the Miracle Ride when it closed an intersection down for an hour, hour right. and a half, <laughs> and you think you didn't piss off people with a little <laughs> ride? Right. Stop them on you know a. Main Street in Indianapolis for an hour, <laughs> unannounced. I used to say that all oh, the time. Oh God, that would piss people off. And all I the never, bikers are waving, they're riding. They're even riding. waving. Hey, uh, I never minded because even in the Miracle Ride, I was one of the front bikes. I'm right through. They're still. You're they're driving still by happy. people that are happy. Oh, there's Rupert. Let's wave. No, no. Wait, you let them go. Fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, and the bikes haven't stopped. Yeah. Thirty minutes, and the bikes haven't stopped. Yeah. Okay. Just like the front bikes on the Indy 500 track. I don't know what happened back in the back, but when I got nobody in front of me on that track, I've rode some pretty nice bikes. That right. victory that I rode, you could lift up the front tire at 100 miles an hour. We hit that track with no one in front of us, and it was a race to see who could hit 200 before <laughs> <laughs> you're off the track. <gasps> oh, yeah. yeah. But anyway... But, you know, so, so yeah, it's so 18 years now. Next year will be 18 yes. up in Lafayette. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Um, Do you want to stop and start? Just start, because we jumped right into it. Uh, we didn't even do really anything, and we just, it, you don't want any intro? I'm stopping already. Are we, or you just keep running it? Oh, we just This is how we it. do. This is. Uh, but, well, then, you know, showing my, un my unpreparedness and my unprofessionality uh, and my little bit of issues with control. Yeah. I don't know if you ever watch Survivor, you know, but <laughs> you know, like, who the hell voted for me? Or, you know, some of the things. Or in the challenges where it's the pecking order and, you know, you win the uh, question. You get the question right and, you know, three or four of them get the question right and you go put a chop on somebody's whatever and three chops and their face is smashed, they're out of the way. I would get mad if you even looked at mine. <laughs> Let alone walk by it or touch it. No, no. Uh, don't mean to try and take control of your show, but oh my gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, because I wanted to add... My, my first question to you is... Uh, actually, you're going to go home with this right here. Oh, good. This is badass beard care. And you're gonna, oh, uh, very good. You're gonna I was look sitting as there. dashing as I am when you're done. I <laughs> I heard I get excited. I heard cameraman West talking about the beard butter and the you know right. uh, mine's a little dry and brittle as you see. I've even you know and I can feel it. I gotta shave. Uh, as we get older mm -hmm. and we get patchier and grayer, <laughs> maybe the beard butter will help bring it back. It does. It actually does. <laughs> and, and I'll be honest. Now you know, for years I always wore mine. And I always had the braids, right. the, the Captain Jack Sparrow yes. braids. Did that forever. Dude, I had no idea. That's all I had to do is put braids in my beard. And my God, my wife was all over me. <laughs> I mean, she called me Jack Sparrow all the time. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, I, said, I don't right. care. You call me whatever That's you want. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, steady but, and regular sex is nice. But then, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> I took her to a concert one time, and Miles Kennedy is her favorite. Yeah. I got, I got. Oh, the that's VIP. exactly why. You, yeah, she saw. You know, she got to see her, him, and Ooh. hug him, talk to him, get her picture, yeah. all that stuff. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have a rock star <laughs> sex tonight. And I told her, you can call me Miles all you want. Yeah. I do not care as long as I'm in yes. there. Oh yes. <laughs> but um. What, what is your favorite bike? Because I know I've seen you on a lot of different bikes and everything else. Uh, how long have you been riding? You know, years ago, back when I lived in Texas, all I had for three years was a little uh, uh, GS850. 
Okay. Um, shaft drive nice. Didn't have to deal with the, the chain. I am that guy that is a house guy and didn't really do. I always had help on cars and bikes and boats and stuff and the motors from the mm -hmm. motor side. I change parts. I do. Uh, the bike I liked the best that had the least repairs was the bike that I bought right after Survivor. I know I'm yeah. Uh, for a couple grand. We're gonna, we're gonna my talk, little we're gonna talk about my Survivor. little Honda Shadow. <laughs> Then I took all the distinctive things off it. It was just a black bike. <laughs> you know, I put saddlebags on it and took out it either peeled off or... <laughs> and nobody really could tell exactly... Well, people that didn't know bikes couldn't yeah. tell what the hell it was. And it wasn't real loud, so it didn't startle anybody. And, right. you know, my, my mother was fine with jumping on that and fine. But... Um, you know, probably my favorite. I love that Southside Harley lets me show up and just get a bike and drive out of the shop. Now, this last time I drove out of the shop and I smacked something on 465. Big hunk of concrete or something. In the middle of 5 o'clock traffic on 465, where we're all going 70 miles an hour, I can't see what's exactly in front of me because right. there's too much traffic. You can't right. you can't see around you, and you got no room to go either way. And all of a sudden, in front of me is a big... And I don't even know exactly what it was. I just saw a big hunk of concrete something, and as soon as I hit it, I tried to jump. You know, I'm on a big busy, you know. Right. 70 miles an hour, and we keep going, and... After I get over it, there's no wiggle in the front end. Or there's no anything. I, you know, we keep going. I'm, I'm cussing at the people next to me saying, you could have gave me room to get over. Right. And I'm screaming at them as, yeah, control issues. <laughs> and as we're going around 465, I'm realizing the front end's heavy. Front end's heavy. To hell, we're having trouble. I'm having trouble, you know, making a turn. Uh, finally, I'm getting off 465 at the Keystone exit, and I slowed down to 40. I'm still at 70. Slow down to 40, and I read the the t and the tire buckles in the front end. Right. There's this. <gasps> okay, I I knew, I knew when I hit it, there was probably something wrong. But I knew if I stopped, I probably wasn't going to keep going. And it wasn't giving me any problems, and it wasn't issues, and it wasn't front end, wasn't jiggling, nothing. And I knew I had 10 minutes to the house. Got to the house. Tried to put air in the front tire. Air tire slide, of course. Tried to put air in the front tire. Realized there's a few parts. I, like I say, I'm a parts changer. I don't know exactly what the front end's supposed to look like, but it looks like there's a part or two missing. Right. Try and put air in the tire. And swear to God, it's coming out the shaft of the tire. When I got it back, I, I trailered it back, of course, to Southside Harley. The guy's looking at me, and I'm explaining that and saying, the air comes out of here, right here, come right there. He's, he can't. I go, okay, well, you know, when you tell me when you try to put air in it, I need to stop by there and find out what the hell I did right. to the bike. But I'm a little afraid they're going to say, oh, you screwed it up bad. You can't have another bike. <laughs> <laughs> um, that has got to be my favorite bike. I have no maintenance. I have a tank of fuel. I right. ride it for as many hundred miles as I want for the weekend and give it back to them. Yep. That is my favorite. The victory was fun. The big old victory. But when I ran for governor, that's for it, Doug. Is that right? Yup. Yup. Look me dead in the eye and said, you're running against our guy. What the hell are you doing? I think it's time for you to give the bike back. And I did. Mm -hmm. so. That's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, Southside's pretty cool because, you know, and, uh, they've let the governor, governor, back when Pence was our right. governor, he, they used to give him they bikes. They gave him a bike. Um, there was uh, some of the guys back when the Colts used to ride in the Miracle right. Ride. A lot they, of those they, guys were They do on a bikes. Bike. Yes, yeah. they've been... Kathy, that owns the place, and now her kids, her daughter's running it. And sweetheart has been a wonderful uh, business owner in the community, mm -hmm. where so many business owners don't give back. Right? right? Yeah, it's pretty cool.
Yeah. But uh, you know, this this the, the podcast is Steel Horse Thunder and Beyond because we do right. talk about more than just motorcycles. Everybody we've had on here is a motorcycle person, mm -hmm. but they might do something different outside of it. You know what I'm saying? Like we went down to um, Frankfort, Kentucky. And there was a band, Anthony Rosano and the Conquerors. It's a three-piece blues band. Mm -hmm. They are fantastic. We love them. And it was like, you know, let's ride down there. I called, you know, got in touch with them and said, hey, man, would you do a podcast? We can do it on location right there. So, dude, after the show, we went and we set up in one of the local music stores and we were able to do the podcast right there. They all ride. All three yeah. of those guys ride motorcycles. But then we could talk about their the rock and roll life. You know what I mean? That kind right. of stuff. So that's what we're here about today. Um I like to get the motorcycle stuff in there right away first. Uh, let everybody know you do ride and and all that. Um, God, now almost fifty years. But but obviously, most I'm people old. most people know you from Survivor. Right. What year were you on Survivor? 2003, 2004, 2010, 2013. Then I did Amazing Race in 2018. Wow, you were a lot more busier than I thought. And I should have done my cameraman <laughs> list. Why didn't you have <laughs> Hopefully, uh, season 50, they say, is going to be returning players. Huh. They are just airing season 47 right now. They just got through taping season 47 and 48, two seasons a year. Wow. They'll air 47 now in it'll finale just before Christmas. Then they'll start uh, season 48 uh, mid-February. Uh, they will go out and tape 49 and 50. Uh, May, June, July, August in those four months and tape a couple of shows because now it's down to 26 days and you know a pussy ass version of the show where it's survivor light at best <laughs> which means at 60 years old I still will be fine but uh, I need everyone out there to get on CBS.com and say we want Rupert back because the rumor is and they've even kind of hinted to my wife Rupert's a little old. We're not crazy about the old players. My God, the old players. Shit. <laughs> um, if you've watched who's playing now, the, the tenacity of some of the players is minimal at best. Yeah. They suck. <laughs> so... So CBS.com, yeah, I would love to play the game. So to answer your question, yeah, 2003, 4, 10, 13, 18, yeah, I played, I played reality TV shows. This, yeah. Well, my question was going to be, when you were on all those years ago, have you noticed a difference? To how it was now? I think you pretty much answered that question. Yeah, you know, well... <laughs> They've gentled it up on a lot of different <laughs> layers. You watch them going out there, and you they say they're not feeding anybody. We didn't eat. I dropped 50 pounds in 27 days, 60 pounds in 37 days. Wow. You watch these guys go out in 26 days, and they're not dropping any weight. They got two or three changes of clothes. They look like they're getting, you know, get your get your tribal outfit on, get your hoodie on, you got your sweatshirt, it's gonna be cold. <laughs> Bullshit kind of crap. I had a tank top in in, in my dress. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what was what was your I'm gonna have to say something now I, I really don't wanna say. Uh -huh. I've never seen one episode of Survivor. <laughs> season <And so> <laughs> 7 is the best one. Season 7 is the Rupert show. Okay. Season 7 and Season 6, we watched uh, a young lady whine and cry about how hard it was and they, they should vote her off. And she won the damn game. And it pissed us all off. I did out there on Season 7... Uh, this is now airing the same air, space, and time, you know, as Friends on Friends last season. Okay. Friends was pulling 32 million viewers a night on Thursday night. Survivor was down to about 10. On the first season seven episode of season seven, Variety went crazy and CBS, everybody went crazy. 12 million viewers to start, a little under, over 14 million by the end of the show. Wow. 
And it went up from there until it beat Friends, and Friends dropped below 30, and Survivor got over 30 million viewers a night. Mm -mm -mm. Until I got voted off, and then they started losing their ass. But... <laughs> Uh, Mark Burnett came to me on the next season because I was that first one to do back to back and said, Rupert, you, you got bigger than my show. I'm not into making celebrities. I'm into making TV shows and you got bigger than my show. I'm knocking the wind out of your sails. If you're not careful, I'm going to watch show. I'm going to show you doing a double take. Richard Hatch's naked ass up there. <laughs> and then you doing a double date again and smiling and everybody's going to think you're a gay, gay guy looking at Richard's ass. <laughs> I said, you didn't just fucking... To heck with you, Mark. <laughs> if that's what you want to do and ruin your damn show, go right ahead. <laughs> of course, they never did. Like a lot of people say out there on the show, that wasn't me, that's my edit. I say... To everyone out there, if you're an ass most of the time, and a good guy a little bit of the time, it's easy to show you as an ass. Right. If you're out there as a good guy most of the time, and an ass some of the time, it's hard to show you as an ass. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, they just didn't show me. They weren't going to show me. Continue to build my... Fucking so easy. <laughs> Uh, so they weren't going to continue to help me build my brand of being tough and being a survivor. Right. So fine, you don't show me. So their numbers kept going down even, you know. And they've never gotten back to 30 million viewers. They're happy with 10 million now. Right. But, you know, I'd still well, play the game. Season 50, CBS.com, say you want River back. And that's the thing, because I remember when you were on... <laughs> <laughs> when you were on the show. And oh, again, yes. I never you didn't watch the damn watched show. People didn't have to. Yes. yes. I knew I knew who you were, and I never watched the show, yes. but that's how you, you oh, got yes. so, so popular from that that I knew you, but didn't even know the show you were on. The easiest, sweetest, simplest gig I've ever had in my life as a job was going out and being me after Survivor and monetizing that, marketing that, doing... Getting paid to sit and sign my autographs and, yeah, and play around and do not and take pictures. And they play thousands of dollars an hour and you know Greatest job ever. Yeah. But yes, you start you use what they give you and keep going. When before Survivor in my mentoring program, people would look at me and say, Ooh, I am not giving that guy another I, I don't even know about you. You know, you you look a little scary. After Survivor? I could take the biggest, toughest, hairy, scariest, meanest looking guy up on stage, man or woman, with me on stage or in front of anyone and say, this person deserves another chance. And they would say, okay. If Rupert says yes, well, they deserve another <laughs> chance. Gave me a hell of a gift. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, my gosh. Now we have a... It's varied a little bit this year, but we have a back to a 12-bed facility, all generated with no tax dollars, no city, state, federal funding, no government dollars, no opioid dollars. Private sector opened it January 8th of 2020. By February 8th of 2020, we were about full. By March 8th of 2020, I had to look at my group and say, this is what's coming. We're going into a shutdown, and they didn't believe me. And the next week, everything shut down, and we, all the appearances, thousands of dollars an hour, gone. All the jobs, gone. All the work, gone. Tough times. But we opened our doors and have been running ever since. We did petition and got up this year to 12 beds, but then the city got a little antsy and said we were supposed to go to the zoning board too. Who the hell knows the zoning board picks? <laughs> we went to the fire marshal. They pick occupancy, you know? But anyway, so we're now back down to 12 and we're petitioning to go back to 16. Okay. And after we get to 16, then we're going to start fighting and working to get the fire suppression. Because after 16 beds, you have to have the overhead sprinklers. Oh, okay. 
Okay. $100,000 for a cheap shit fire uh, uh, fire suppression system. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, you know, that might be a little down the road. The women's facility is a little closer at, you know, 50 to 75 grand getting that set up. <laughs> so they don't we don't care, have it. They don't care about the women as much as the men, so they don't charge as much. No, no, no. <laughs> like, what kind the, of women's, <laughs> the women's <laughs> facility that yeah, we don't have open yet. No, no, no. No, not the <laughs> fire suppression system. No. Getting the women's facility open, we still have to do some remodeling on the building that we okay, have. We okay. still have to do some structural stuff to split it up so that when we bring women in that are trying to reunite with their kids they can have that space and that separation they can we can that's why i say 50 75 grand away from even just creating it took years to create the men's side and a few hundred thousand dollars we've been working on the women's side for a few years we're down to about 50 to 75 to get the women's side up and running which yeah. we will have way before we have a damn fire suppression system in the men's side. <laughs> right. All right, now. We and, can... and wait, I say side, but it's not like they're on one side of the wall and the other side. No, no. They're, okay. you know, no, 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 no. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, we don't want, we don't want knocking them no, no, the No, like no, no, no. Just like survivor well, babies. We don't need no, no, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> Group home babies. And I, and I know we kind, we kind of just jumped right into this part of it. Um, Explain what your organization yeah. is. Let, let's let's do a little. Let's do some backstory. Yes, we'll do backstory. Yes. you've been on TV. You know how we do yes. backstories now. Now that we're halfway into this thing, we'll backstory it. You know, years ago, I watched our public schools that are stated in our constitutions that they will educate all our children. Uh, create the zero tolerance, three strikes, and you're out. Uh, different programs that they started putting their problem children out of school and denying them an education. I had been in the institutions down in Texas from 83 to 90 and moved back to Indianapolis in 1990 to take care of my adoptive grandparents and uh, was working the bars at night and taking care of them during the day. So got to know a lot of people around Broad Ripple and met a young lady that her 14 year old child had been thrown out of school for cussing out a teacher and threatening a teacher. Uh, I know this young man, I'm sure he was antagonized a little bit by the teacher. I know teachers mm -hmm. are frustrated and you know it's a hard job. My mom taught high school for 16 years. I know it's a tough job. But now they have that panic button where they can say uh, worthy or not this child's a problem, take him out of my class, he threatened me, did whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and they can put you out of school until next semester. Next, you know, if we had any parents, any people that were keeping their children from school, it would be neglect. But our schools right. that are uh, constitutionally uh, bound to educate our children can. Uh, I started working with Jake, this young man, uh, backing my days off at the bar. My grandparents, one had already passed away, another one was pretty sick. In the days they were spending more time in the hospital than anything, we were pulling side jobs. And I tell them, if you're not going to school, you're going to go to work and learn how to make a damn living. Uh, worked like that for years, incorporated in 91 as... Kids Hope, Kids Helping Other People Exist. Uh, back in 91, there were, you know, uh, between 500 and 1,000 nonprofits in central Indiana, based in central Indiana. Not a whole lot. People didn't see nonprofits as lying in their pockets. Ran that for 12 years. I uh, got involved in the detention centers in uh, Indianapolis with Judge Payne's court, and on 25th and, and Keystone, would go in there and drop the gavel on as young as 12 year old mostly boys but if you are a hard enough tough enough young lady you know even some girls drop the gavel on them deem them incorrigible say fine you don't have to go to school now you have a choice you go to work or you go to juvie back in the 70s i remember you go to jail or you go to vietnam 
we just changed the program a little bit to go take care of yourself or go sit in jail and learn how to be a better criminal. That's never an answer, and they don't want to, especially the 12-year-old. You're telling me I can go to work and I don't have to go to school? Hell no, I'll take work! All right. Until they realize work. Every 12-year-older I ever had, by the time they were 15, was back in some kind of education. I wish I could say that on any other group, but every, all 38 of them, I know got an education, got back, saw the value in working at a 12-year-old alongside a 16, 18-year-old kid that still is struggling, still going to have trouble, but in June, out of any help you're going to actually get, right. and then you break the law. It's big boy jail. Ran that for 12 years. Uh, used to show guys on my in my program that were living in the you know inner city Indianapolis, hard-ass little land. Someday this world is going to know who I am and know I'm good. I was one of my guys. I got popped at 10 years old for pot. I got popped at 18 years old. I got popped at 20 years old. I got... Um, showed I was one of them, but someday this world is going to know who I am. You know, and they would, you got to have life goals. You have daily goals. You try to get up. My, right. my goal, hit you guys and be able to do your podcast and do my just goals in life to kind of help yourself get through life. Have that life goal. My new life goal. Change the damn system. Start showing how we're getting more and more of us working in the system than uh, those that have never been through the addictions, never been through the pain, never been through the homelessness. So we ran that for 12 years. I went out to play Survivor. I remember, I still remember the first day I saw the TV show. I was thinking, the bastards, those lucky ass people, how'd they find out about that show? I went on that show. Took me two years to get on the show. Is that right? I, I had never... my own guys, my own buddies telling me, what the hell? I Because after I saw the show, I started telling everybody, I'm going to be on the show. I played State Fair Survivor in 2000 with Q95 in an 8 foot by 10 foot hut and made it to the end of that, but brought the wrong damn person back. Huh. And instead of bringing the one back that everybody hated, I brought the one back that everybody loved, that never won anything sweet, little Missy, that won the damn truck, my truck, <laughs> won the truck and the check I got the shirt and hat that I'd been wearing for 10 days and a pat on the ass as I left but I used all that in my video I used me being a back alley bouncer I used me in the Everglades cats and gators and snakes and turtles and shit and and got on the real survivor and went out and played and showed the world who the hell I am showed my guys didn't realize it would take a year and a half to get back to survivor because I was that first one that did back to back survivor mm-hmm but as I went to incorporate Kids Hope and get the domain names and all, because I'd never been on the website. I mean, my, when I left for Survivor, we still had phone books, and my address phone yeah. number was still in the phone book. Yeah. Phone books. Some wonderful entrepreneur out there had already bought Kids Hope, Kids Helping Other People Exist, and Rupert Bonham, .com and .org, trying to sell them to me for $100,000 a piece. We dissolved that and incorporated Rupert's Kids. When we did that, we realized there were 5,000 nonprofits based just in Indianapolis. The greed of people is insane these huh. days. It's not the need, it's the greed mm -hmm. where people... But, I wish I would have realized the need or for aging the group up because we, with doing that, we gave up our nonprofit status. Reapplied. Three months go by instead of three years. Fed's calling up saying, you know, is this really Rupert from Survivor? We're reading your application right now. Is this really the Feds that can give me my nonprofit status back? We had a conversation a couple different times, but I didn't have the lawyers involved. I didn't have all kinds of shit involved. I didn't do all that because I had Rupert from Survivor behind me and 12 years of filing already. And their deal was there are so many programs for minors, for juveniles. They told me if you would just age your program up to that transition period, that huh. that emancipated 16, 17-year-old to that 27-year-old kid, you don't have to get too old, you know, you just get take that transition group and focus on, we'll give you a nonprofit status back right now. Pulled my mission statement, pulled my application, changed minor to youth, sent it all back in. 
had my nonprofit status back, we kept going, kept running. The program just changed, just aged up a little mm -hmm. bit and got a little older. We've been running then for almost 20 years in Marion County, running a work crew. We would gather them every morning and work five, six days a week. For years, we did 11 city parks, taking over $100,000 out of the budget working on the parks. For years, we did hundreds of miles of medians through Indianapolis. But my God, it was putting the kids' life in line when you're driving the medians, cutting in there, running right. 50, 60 miles an hour right there. Every once in a while, somebody would oh, yeah. fall asleep at the wheel or fall into their la-la land and drive into the medians, and guys would have to run out of the way. I had people hit our mowers before. But for years, we tried to create the beds also because we knew as we're taking these men and women every morning, some of them we'd have to deal with with their addictions and we wouldn't take them if they were all fucked up. But every night, you know, you're letting them go back into hell situations where sometimes you have to compromise your body for your damn housing, where you have to do or at least overlook or be around things that you're trying to stay away from just to keep your bed. Yeah. Uh, even the children, when we were just minors, would struggle with family. Yeah. Most of us learn a lot of our... My first charge was with my cousin. Eight years old or nine years old. Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> we have for decades taught young men and women how to make a legal living, have a sense of self-worth and work ethic, used the landscaping and the trades. Buying board up band and burn up properties, gutting them down, putting them back together, selling them at an extreme discount to our participants. A hundred thousand dollar home we'd sell for twelve, fifteen thousand. Put you on a mortgage. I've got one. He's got you know fifteen, sixteen more payments at four hundred dollars a month, no interest, and the house is his. Wow. Um, wow. Being able to show how. And every once in a while, you take one and you drop it for, you create a $100,000 check, $150,000 check for yourself, you put it in the bank. That's how we made it through COVID. You know, we sold a property for $100,000 that literally I had $1,000 in. Nice. You do the cleanup, you get the death and rot out of it, you jack the suckers back up, the things that don't cost a lot of money, fixing the block and the foundation, fixing things that terrify others that really are just labor. Mm -hmm. I got a ton of labor and I can sit right here and make you carry all the blocks to me and teach you how to put them on that are a great skill to have. And it puts a house back together. We've sold houses where we just fixed the foundation, bought it for $500, $1,000, fixed a falling in foundation and sold it for $20,000. Didn't even do anything upstairs and did it in five weeks. Uh. Uh. <laughs> Teaching young men and women that you don't have to be an angel. You just have to stop being an ass. You stop hurting yourself and others. You stop taking from others. You start learning how you work together with society. You get along with society. You go to work every day. You make a legal living and go on. You know, it's mm -hmm. amazing what happens. And we try very hard, even in our now... 12 bed facility to show them how we can hook them up on different government programs that will help you pay your even, I almost said $20 a day, we just got a raise to $30 a day for the beds that I've got them hooked up in Indiana. If you are convicted of a felony, there is an $8,000 account set off to the side for you, but nobody tells you about it. That's the first I've ever heard of it. Uh, you can access it through RecoveryWorks, RecoveryWorks.org, probably Indiana.gov, RecoveryWorks.org. If you have any problems, Rupert's Kids, office at Rupert'sKids.org comes right to me. If you are that felon out there that has not been given the chance to access, and you are on paper right now, has not been given the chance to access RecoveryWorks funding to help pay for your housing, your transportation, your therapy, your all kinds of stuff. 
Uh, I get them hooked up on that where the first three months they pay the $30 a day. The fourth month they make you pay one week. <laughs> the fifth month you pay two weeks, you know, and they mag it up yeah. to, to get you to that ninth or tenth month where finally you're just starting to pay your, but you've had months to save money and build up a nest and to walk out the door with thousands of dollars and your car paid for and a job and first and last in deposit. Done. Let's go. Sometimes if they're willing to stay long enough, they walk out putting that down payment on their house that they're buying for, like Sean is, for uh, $400 a month for 36 months. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty... Where did you get the, the smarts and the know-how of... I mean... I know when I started doing this show, mm -hmm. Steve Reeves retired and he wanted Cindy and I to yes. do this show. I, I had no problem being in front of a camera. I was a preacher for <laughs> 20 plus years, all right? right. So I've, I've been in front of cameras. I've been in front of people. I public speaking. I do all that stuff. That wasn't a problem. The problem was there was a business. So mm -hmm. was, I didn't know shit about the business end. I knew nothing about that. And it took me years to learn and I and I we jumped in and of course Steve ended up passing away right literally the the I said my goodbye prayer to him the night after we had edited our very first episode yeah I went to him I knew he was leaving that night I knew he was gonna pass that night uh, I knew it that morning when I woke up out of bed prayed with him said goodbye to him and now I'm I've got. I'm, I'm a business owner, mm -hmm. and I don't know. Got to think about well, the bottom so, dollar, bottom line. Got to think about bringing in revenue. Got to think about your future. If you don't pay attention to your future, you will not have one, a good one, really. If you do not pay attention, it will not be what you could give yourself. Yeah. So how did you, how did years, you know to get into it? How did you know where to? Years ago. One of the values that was taught to me was self-reliance. I mean, I took my daughter to work with me at two and a half years old. She had a hammer and nails in her hand. She had, <laughs> at three, she got her own little Makita 9.2. Couldn't really drive a screw or pull that shit out like, great, take some shit over. She'd have this sucker laying out right... Uh... You know, 10 years old, I was interviewed in my living room for a paper route that the guy said, you're the, going to be the youngest by five years. Um, by 15, I was swim pra pa double paper route, swim practice twice a day, swim practice in the morning, high school, swim practice in the afternoon, and then pet land in the evening. Mm -hmm. Until I was 16 and got double pneumonia, damn near died and realized, screw that swimming shit, it ain't making no damn money, and I can't quit school because they, they won't let me yet. So I just worked. Um, being that guy that never fit in the 9 to 5 mm -hmm. world, I've always looked at, I was the kid that would buy bubble gum and sell, buy the hubba bubba, the bubble gum, the bubble yum, bubba bullshit, break it up and sell the little cubes for five, ten cents. Back in the 60s, you know, I don't know, a nickel, a penny, what, I was right. doubling, tripling my money and I would do it enough that I was making money. Um... I you did, I did to, that too, but it didn't you, pan out for me. For you was, you, worked, it you it didn't public. let your future grow with yeah. your entrepreneurial skills. I've shown a lot of dealers, a lot of hustlers, a lot of um, slick willies how to go from a taker to a giver, but giving to yourself too, and you create the deals where everybody wins. You want the bubble gum in class? You're willing to pay three times what it's worth? You know, great, here you go. I might get in a little trouble, but it's not that bad. Right. Um, you go from that then to that, you know, pet shop job where when there's, you're selling dogs and you stick in everyone's card, I'll come clean your yard. I remember charging a nickel a turd years ago. 
Uh, but you, can you do that in your later teens? And, you know, my God, now there's trucks driving around with the big logos. We clean the shit in your yard. That's a real job now. <laughs> they have tractors. Anyway, you start. I've always been that guy that's looked at the next getting a little bigger. Doing a little more, making the bigger check, just like buying the piece of shit house. You should have, if you got ten thousand dollars in the bank, you should have a realtor out there looking for any property under ten thousand dollars. And look at them. You'll find some that are two, three thousand dollars, terrifying as hell. But all you got to do is take the rot out of it, and then you double or triple your money. Because somebody else, like my wife, has seen these stupid, oh, you can fix it show, or oh, DIY, oh, you just, you just bang the sledgehammer into the wall and then come back and it's all good now. <laughs> um, you can sell that house ready to be all good now for two, three, four, five times what you bought it for. Like I say, the little foundation, we bought a thousand dollar home and sold it for twenty thousand. Less than a thousand dollars in material and labor in it. Hmm. We just made it so it wasn't so scary. Right. Great. Then you open up the market more. Let them go kill themselves trying to make that extra fifty or sixty. You may you did on the percentages. You beat them all. Right. Right. So that's how I've always been my program. That's how I've taken young men and women and jangled that out in front of them. You want your own vehicle. You want your own home. You don't want to be working for others. You want to stop thinking about a job and start thinking about a career. But a career is taking care of yourself, paying your bills, and making everything okay. Being able to say, I want to go to Cayman Islands for a week and go. Be able to say, I want to take the time off. I want to do not just drive down to Florida like we do and drive back up and hooray, that's vacation. Yes, I've done that 20 times in 60 years. <laughs> right. Or do something else. Well, do it. Stop talking about it. Um, same way with your future. If you don't plan on something better, if you just keep doing the same thing, it never changes. No, that's right. That's, that is true. Even uh, everything I've tried has not worked for damn sure. Right after Survivor, I created many companies, a TV, television, production company that only lasted seven years, but it did great for those years until I trained too many people to do it, and they came behind me and turned in contracts cheaper than me. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> running a record label, I've got awards from... Uh, the billboards charting organizations, billboards giving me awards for my little independent record label that is the only independent record label in billboards charting history to hold the number one slot on the rock label, uh -huh. on the rock chart. Not right. the alternative rock. Our song with the Dirty Heads held it for 11 weeks on the alternative rock, but one when we got it in the stupid little penguin movie. It hit the number one rock song for the week. First time ever. Silly little me. Um, I, that was my third record label. You know, first two were a little struggle. My first one, I saw you on TV. I heard that so much, I created that label. My my agent in LA said, if you want to do voice work, you got to be published. You got to be. You got to get work before you can get work. Create your own label and record yourself and sell it. Great, there it is, here it is. Yeah, and you start doing, you try all kinds of shit. Just because you're trying it doesn't mean it's going to work. Um, I've lost as many companies as I've created easily. But I've still done better than uh, not trying. Right. And we've taught so many that your failure... Really, especially if you can see it coming and you don't let it destroy you. I mean, hell, I ran for governor of Indiana and just oozed money for a year and a half. I had to talk to my wife and tell her, I'm sorry, halfway through the campaign when our accounts were getting down to nothing and we're starting to look at what we can sell. I'm sorry I created a scenario where I work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and I just spend money. It was pitiful, yeah. and I just spent money. But um, 
it was a great learning experience. It was a great teaching experience for my I was showing and I still use it. I mean, I made Indiana history with getting more votes than any other third party candidate in history before. Now I've been beat since, but I, I think that I brought a lot of libertarians to the party. Mm -hmm. But showing my men and women in my program, if you've got something to say, if you've got something you want to change, figure out how to change it. Figure out how to do it. Like I say, I'm, my next life goal is to change the system. We're getting more peer recovery coaches involved in our programs. We're getting more of us that are ex-addicts into the jails, talking to other, ex other addicts, active addicts, on the path to a better life. You know, mm -hmm. and not just one path, but as many people as are in the detention center, give that many paths. A A N A B A P do whatever this that, that does it fit everyone? Right. Another reason why we've lasted so long and been able to collect so much help from the community. We are open to all religions, all faiths. We're open to all races. We're open to, and we're open to all paths. Your path might not fit them, but as long as it is a path to sobriety and productivity and quality of life, if you feel like your life is better, great. You know, if you, you're not struggling every day with the drama of, you know, paying your bills and, and wondering how the hell you're going to make it um, in the addictions, where you're going to find the next bump or what you're going to have to do for right. it, you know, yep. or whatever. It, but, um, you know, for any of those out there that don't really still know what we do, rupertskids.org. Please go check out the website. You can get applications on our website for our reentry program. Uh, you can see some of the stuff we're doing with our work crew that uh, we've even started our aftercare programs now that we've been up and running with uh, the beds for the last four and a half coming up on five years. We've got enough uh, graduates that are coming back and wanting to give back and work with some of our current participants best thing you can ever do is hear from one of your peers right. how they made it instead of a 60 year old man telling you you gotta you gotta fucking change your ways yeah. you don't know you know now when you get the word right from the horse's mouth you know what i'm saying yes. when you're talking to somebody that's gonna put it right there uh Yesterday we were do we had we had a big meeting, bunch of charity ride people, you mm -hmm. know, different organizations that put all these rides together. Uh, you know, John and Nikki Glass. Mm -hmm. um, they had this big meeting, and we all got together, and we were talking about the rides that we did this year. You know, it's, some of them are annual rides. Rupert's ride right. was one of them, the one that's out of Shelbyville. Right. And um, talking about that different stuff, but. And, and, and it's all great. And we can hear, I can hear, listen to John talk about, we had this many bikes, we raised this much money, we're going to be back next year, it's going to be this uh, this date, la, la, la. And that's all cool. But we did a ride for a young man who had been beaten by a, with a two-by-four yeah. uh, up in Indianapolis. We did a ride in March of last of this year. Mm -hmm. In March, it was cold, it was, and now it was forty five, <laughs> sunny and forty five. So we were all yeah. like, "Damn, this ended up right. pretty nice." It was a lot nicer than anybody expected in in early March, but um, you know they raised a lot of money for that. That young man's mom came to the meeting. Mm -hmm. When you listen to what mom has to say, now again, we did this event in March. Out of say 150 people showed up mm -hmm. there's only been two or three that have actually kept in touch to follow up on everything mm -hmm. you know and the rest of the rest of the people you know they did what they could do and now they've gone on they're helping people all year long but when mom comes in you know and, and to me the first thing that was mentioned was the fact that he is kind of semi-coherent now he still, right he still can't talk and it's like dear god that's been you know what right. i mean you start realizing Shit, that's almost been that's it's been nine months it's like how and, and and it's still an everyday thing for them but to hear them talk about you know getting the money and they were able to get a lift for the van right 
they were able to buy a van with a lift kit and everything else to be able to transport. And uh, when you hear it coming from those people, oh yes, you hear it coming from somebody who, who, who was there. You know what I mean? It, it's it's a whole lot different than when you hear the organizer of the ride telling you what's going on. And I can see that's where it would be when one of your one of your guys that are currently going through a program can talk to somebody else. It makes a it makes a big difference. I don't know if you can see me sweating a little more. And I don't know if you can hear John and Nikki Glass uh, out there in, in TV <laughs> land cheering you on, saying, get him, get him. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I know. I probably, I didn't realize, you know, it would be better if I was there, but there's so many places it would be better if I was there. Uh, I like the idea of a guy there or somebody there showing the value in the program. That's really good. But mm -hmm. that was, was on Sunday, and that was was yeah. that wait was that just yesterday? Yeah, just oh, yesterday. Damn it! No, damn it. Because I was thinking, wait, 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 wait. No, you were busy. I know you were um, busy. So I knew you. John were called me up on a Thursday <laughs> or Friday, saying he needed a three to five minute video. I got the message that Saturday or Sunday and thought in my head, oh shit, it's already Sunday. Damn it, I wish he would have gave me more time. He, John, you might have gave me a week or two. <laughs> but I didn't realize that and I didn't do the damn video. <laughs> and I'm very sorry. <laughs> but for everybody out there, it is one hell of a ride at the Shelbyville ride in June, my God. You'll see me out there telling all kinds of stories, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and it is a very good cause. There are very few programs out there that house, feed, train, clothe, empower our next and sometimes current gen, our, you know, our peers and our younger generation to become self-sufficient, self-reliant, and then in turn try and empower their children to breaking cycles with no government dollars. I was going to say, you have two things that impress me more than anything. That's one of them. <laughs> the no yeah. government dollars. Right. If, if, if there was one thing that was going to say, you know what, I want to back somebody, that's something that I'm right. going to say, oh, hell yeah, I will jump on board with that. You know, the reason we do the show the way we do the show is because I want to do the show the way I want to do exactly the show. Exactly right. When Wish TV owned the show, you did it exactly oh, you how they Oh, you do what they say or you don't get the time. And you're where you're supposed to be. Yes. And you do what you're supposed to do. You say what they tell you to say. And so, therefore, we don't make the money on this show like Steve Reeves made, but I have freedom. <laughs> and I can, <laughs> do okay. it, I can do yes. it the way I want to do it. So, the no tax dollars is a big thing. Your recovery rate. Your su or success rate, I should say. Yes. Your success rate yes. is freaking off the um, charts. The reason for such a high 70s, high 70s percentage of successes, three out of four that come to us are going to be okay. And sometimes even that fourth one makes it. It's amazing. When you are willing, and it's not always they make it on their first try. They might take two or three tries. They might look you dead in the eye after two or three weeks or months being there saying, screw you, I'm not listening to your damn shit, I'm out of here, and even run away and pull another charge before they come back and say, okay, I was an idiot. Mm -hmm. um, we track you three years out from leaving us, and it is amazing how few... Reoffend after three years, and the national average is seventy percent reoffend even after their first wow. charge. Wow. Because you've gotten you've gotten your taste into the system. The right. system has your number. They start looking out for you more. They've already got you reporting, doing something. Like I tell a lot of judges, a lot of bailiffs, a lot of people in the system, when we worked even closer in Indianapolis with a lot of the cops on the street, I might look them dead in the eye, you know, if I was checking your piss every day, if I was checking everywhere where you were going, if I had an electronic cracker showing me where you went every day, I could catch you doing stuff too. Right. We set the guys up, men and women up in our system, uh, to create more of a system, to create more money, to create more. Instead of helping the 
cause. Mm -hmm. We work on symptoms of lack of education, um, uh, way too many damn pills on the market, way too many drug cabinets where, you know, I remember even my grandmother uh, was like on a hundred milligrams of Xanax a day. She was 110 pounds, you know. Our drug companies have really created, and I've watched for 40 years. I mean, I started in the institutions back in the 80s. Watch just pushing pills. Yep. You got a pain, here's a pill. It's not going to cure you. It's going to take the symptoms away. If we cure you, we'll go broke. <laughs> right? If the system works on the cause, it gets less. The system wants to always grow by 5 or 10 percent a year to show their worth and their value. No, we need to stop letting them lull us into a damn false sense of security and stand up and say we should be decreasing our numbers instead of increasing. We are still one out of six people that are incarcerated around the world are incarcerated here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we are not a sixth of the world's population. Uh, no, right. a sixth, one in six, that's way more than a sixth, one in six people right. in the detention centers around the world. We have finally stopped locking everyone up, and our numbers are down below 25% of our population in detention or on trackers. Indianapolis, the largest number of trackers in any city USA. Really? Indianapolis. Huh. They are down to charging, trying to charge $3 a day because they can't get people to even pay for the damn things. In Shelbyville, it's $15 a day and they destroy you over it. We need to get control of our government. That's why I ran for governor, not to be a damn career politician, to bring some credibility to our government to show the 365, 368 agencies. There's what do you mean there's three agencies that don't show up on any of these lists? Where the hell's that money go? What the hell you mean everybody is given $8,000 when they, in a fund, when they commit a felony in Indiana? For them to use twice through their lifetime of addiction, trying to help them restore their livelihood, restore their residence. If you're not told about it, how the hell are you supposed to use it? Where the hell do you think that money goes after it's sat for long enough? Into somebody's war chest. Right. Right. Uh, when I was illegally, falsely accused in this state of not paying uh, sales tax. We don't sell a damn thing. But my wonderful buddy, Frank Anderson, uh, the, the... Rest his soul, poor guy. He's dead already, you know. The... the the sheriff in Marion County that was for 50 years or more the highest paid employee, governmental employee in the state. Marion County Sheriff. Oh. Because every account, our wonderful government at work, every account that he signed off on clearing illegally and without due process, he got $1,750 put in his pocket. Written up in the laws. Wow. When, our, when our wonderful government got caught with their hands in the cookie jar over the damn uh, land bank and all the bullshit and they stuck 60 grand in a duffel bag and put it in an idiot's hand that walked out of his job and to his car. And imagine that. They popped him and said he was the mastermind. When I realized years, 25 years ago, and I was creating the uh, Near Northeast Side Community Development Corporation, and I let people get on the board. That's why I control my board so much now. I let people get on the board that wanted to line their pockets and figured out how to. And got involved with the land bank, got involved with empowering themselves, got involved with signing themselves properties and, you know, 
I'm setting myself up for all kinds of lawsuits, and I'd love to take any one of you guys on. But, um, what was the question? <laughs> now you do, <laughs> you have a uh, a fundraiser that you do at the at, in November. Yes, we it's, do. It's Our twentieth annual coming up November twenty third at the casino out in Shelbyville on uh, beautiful I seventy four. It is tuxes and tennies. Uh, you know, back years ago when I sold everybody's shoes and I got to be the good guy pirate, it kind of tied me to shoes and footwear. Fancy pants attire with nice footwear. Gotcha. Tuxes and tannies. Um, you know, last year we generated over $100,000. It was amazing. We have already generated, and our goal was another $100,000 this year. With the Eskew family that has given the... Uh, presenting sponsorship package and already signed that check over with the sponsorships that we've sold with the tables and the seats that we've sold now we're five six weeks away so we're getting close you better get your tickets now we're almost 35 40 percent of our budget uh, of our projected goal already nice i'm hoping to be at the fifty thousand dollar mark before we even walk in the door and generate the next fifty for anybody out there that's never been to a Tuxes and Tennies, it is the start of Christmas season. We have two tables this year set up with just Christmas presents. Walk up donation. If you want to give a dollar for, you know, a back massager, a dehumidifier, a toaster, a blender, a whatever. We get a lot of donations from a lot of different retailers. This is all stuff that was donated to us, so even a dollar. But there are a lot of people out there that will give 10s and 20s and 50s and 100s. Mm -hmm. Last year at our fundraiser, we have some really cool gambling stuff and games and stuff where you play heads or tails, you know, flipping coins for heads or tails, and you win hundreds a thousand dollars worth of prizes and stuff we do the raffles where you're gambling we do all kinds of gambling last year we made just under three thousand dollars in gaming in gambling we made almost four thousand dollars on the christmas table so we're having two christmas tables this year <laughs> so and we're still gambling don't worry <laughs> But uh, being able to show, we have one or two of our current participants that will be up on stage telling their story. I'll be up on stage talking about what we were doing, what we were talking about last year, because last year we were doing the drive for our $40,000 roof. I mean, we just finished the front part, the 2,000 square feet of roof of living space for twenty grand, eighteen grand. To do the roof so the drips weren't hitting you on the head when you're sleeping. Right. But the $40,000 for the back and trying to increase our bed. So there will be updates on the program and what's going on. There's also going to be some people talking about what they're doing in the program now. And there's usually a graduate or two that will come out and talk about where they are now. You know? And... Uh, we've got a DJ coming out, so we're going to be doing some dancing and playing around. We've got a live and silent auction, so we've got a lot of cool stuff. And there's always 20th annual. I'm kind of running out of Survivor stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm down to some of the really coolest of the cool stuff. So there might only be one or two items, but it's items that, I mean, like last year, it was my pants that I wore on Survivor. It's my stuff. It's my treasures that are going now. So there's always something cool out there. <laughs> and, you know, it's a great way to come out and support our program. Seats are a $100 individual ticket, or you can buy an eight top for $750. Sponsorship package start at $1,000, and then, you know, they go up from there. Uh, it's just a great way to come out and see what's happened in our program, getting the updates, and seeing a few of the young men and women that are getting the benefits of second, third, fourth, fifth chances. That's the thing. Yeah, yes. more, more than just yes. three strikes you're out. Oh, dear, yes. Dear God, I struck out so many oh. times up until 1987. You don't know. I right. struck out a bunch since then, um, too, but I mean, I had some major strikeouts up until 1987. And uh, thank God, somebody, I mean, my wife, 
my wife at my lowest point. And I remember she was living in Indiana. I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, and right. I hit rock bottom. Right. And she wanted me to move up here and, and all that. And I was I remember I called her and I said, Look, I got nothing. I got a suitcase full of clothes. That's all I have. If you want me to come up there, you're gonna have to come get me and la la la. And she did. She did. Uh, if my daughter did something like that, <laughs> you'd be telling her, Who the hell are you going to pick up? This ass would have been dead. What kind of bomb do you think you're going to bring home? <laughs> no, like, no, that's right. But that's See, I mean, sweetheart. But she did it, and she came and got me, and literally my life changed from that point on. Right. My life changed. Right. And there was somebody that saw something in me I didn't see myself. Yes. Nobody sure as hell nobody else you saw know, it. You know, my own parents didn't see it. Uh, <laughs> and yet she saw something and, and brought me home, and even her parents. And I was everything they didn't want. Oh, I'm I, sure. I was a long hair guy. I had been married once already, and I already had a child. And now I'm asking for their baby daughter, their baby girls, mm -hmm. and a marriage. I, and yet they welcomed me into the home. Right. And and that's what it took. It really did. Now, I, I'll be honest. I slipped back again since then. We went back to Georgia right after we got married. Yeah. Got right back. To, Atlanta was my kryptonite. Yeah. And as soon as I got back there, I got back with all my old buddies. Again, not bad people, right. but they were doing the things that I didn't have the control yes. over. So the cocaine, the LSD, the you know yes. that stuff, it just came. Stuff that's not going to give you right your back. future. Yeah. It came right back, and you know it took me two years for Cindy to say, "All right, this is not going to last." I'm yeah. telling you, this isn't going to work. And you know, I mean, for me, I did have a, a, an experience at a, at a church altar that, and there was nobody else around me, just me. And, and and God above, and I had uh, an awakening, and I haven't been the same since then. Yeah. But I also knew I can't stay here. Yeah. I got to get my ass out of Atlanta. And so here we came to Indiana. That's and good. It was bar none best move I ever did yeah. in my entire life. And but it, but it does. You, you can strike out so many times, but when you finally get somewhere where you can, and you have that aha moment. You go to this Texas and Tennies, and you're going to get to hear from people that oh, yes. truly have lived. And, and are experiencing exactly what you're providing for them, but you're hearing it from them. And that's why you not being at the meeting yesterday was even better. Because you are a celebrity. <laughs> Whether you want to be or not, you are a celebrity. Yes. Mom that came up to that platform, right. nobody in there knew who the hell oh, of mom course. was. Oh, when I know. When, when she came up, I know. nobody knew that. And that's where, to me, that's when it's it, it, it's real. It, it's it's There's no... There's no gimmick. There's no nothing else about it. Right. Other than now, here here's a mom that's bawling her eyes out, saying thank you for what you guys did. That to me speaks volumes. You know what I mean? And oh that's, yes. To be able to go there and to be able to hear people that are going through the program that can talk about what it's done for them. Right. That's it's, what it's all about. It's well worth coming out. And you know, if you do it right, you can get ninety percent of your your Christmas list done that night. <laughs> right. <laughs> Last year, I was telling people just buy gifts you don't even know because it's the, November twenty third. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you haven't really put your Christmas list together yet, but you know you gotta buy for your aunt, your uncle, your mom, your dad, your whoever, your cousin, your kid, your whatever. Buy four or five gifts. Get four or five things. Get some big ticket items. Bring them home, even if two of them just go to you. Start your Christmas list. It's. Uh, it, I had people last year that almost finished their Christmas shopping before December. It's uh, a wonderful thing, and it helps our mentoring program. Mm -hmm. um, like you say, being able to show, uh, it's not just first, you know, second chance. We all deserve another chance. Now the bar raises when you tell us, you know, piss off, and you walk away, and you, you know, or screw you. And, and you want to come back, the bar raises, of course you can come back. Of course you can come back. I mean, until the day you are dead, you should be given another chance. Right. That's when you really don't get another chance, is when you can't yeah. get another chance. Other than that, we deserve to help each other enough, show each other how to be, you know, okay. Like you say, you don't have to be an angel. Right. So, just quit being an ass. Quit being an ass. <laughs> That's one of my favorite sayings of yours. Oh, yes. I do like it. Um, you know, I, I've i got pretty much, uh, we have covered it. Maybe not in the order I planned on, but we covered it. I got <laughs> everything we were planning on doing. 
Um, you know, it's funny because I know you're. I know you're. You're an animal guy. You're. You're a reptile. Yes. Guy. I was always a reptile guy myself. Uh, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I lived in an apartment in Atlanta, Georgia, for so many years that it was hard to have a dog or a cat. Right. So I ended up right. with snakes and. Pets like with fur, you gotta feed them every day. You know, my pets with scales, I've got some big boys that eat every six weeks. They might eat 15 pounds of rats and rabbits, but you know, every six weeks, that's fine. Right? Right? Yes. Well, that's why I was so, I was, so, I was like, hey, so Rupert's a ripped out guy, sweet. And then I talked yeah. to you, I was like, no, he's not. He's a dinosaur guy. <laughs> I love dinosaurs, I'm yes. I'm a reptile guy. I, I enjoy, you know, your typical snakes and your tortoises and your, yeah, well, your yeah. bearded dragons, your iguanas. I, that's that my one. tiger retic that was tougher than me that I, I finally ended up giving away because it was... It was tough, you know. You get a, an 18 foot, 20 foot snake that's 115, 120 pounds. Um, Wally, that is, you know, my my little baby. That's, you know, just like this, Wally. You can see Wally in the book, in my book. That's, you know, fresh out of the egg. Going on 30 years old now. Um, Yes, I always was that kid that wanted my own dinosaur. I, I've got dinosaurs. My dad was a geologist. It still is a geologist. was the head geologist out at IU at Kokomo. So we would go out. He would go out and do different expeditions, do different digs around Indiana. And we did fern and we did coral and different, you know, stuff. And, man, it just hooked me. It hooked yeah. me. Love the dinosaurs. And you yeah. know, reptiles are just that extension. They're just little dinosaurs. They, I mean, they really are. Yes. I mean, when you, you yeah. start talking about the, I mean, even even oh, the tortoises, the, the big tortoises that have stuff. been around for hundreds of millions yeah. of years. Yeah. Yes. And they are. They, I've always yes. been attracted to them, and, and but not to the extent. It was like I almost felt like an idiot when I first started talking to you <laughs> no, no. earlier this year, and it was like. And you start telling me, I was like, oh, well, shit, you don't have reptiles, you yeah, got dinosaurs, I, I, I got reptiles, I had chameleons that got yeah. this big, you know what I mean? I got a, I had a, well, now, I did have, I had a green iguana back in the 70s, mm -hmm. remember when they were, oh, yes. everybody had a bazillion of them. I had one I named Momar Gaddafi, because <laughs> he was so mean, <laughs> yeah. and that was back when Momar Gaddafi yes. was running around, so I named him Momar. Uh, that was one I think I told you about it. The pet store mm -hmm. gave them to me. They said we just oh, want yes. them out, we want them out of our store. That's back in the day when pet shops they're, really were. They're too mean were cool. And, but uh, I did have I had one that I had for a long, long time. Green iguana. Mm -hmm. and he was he was a big six footer man. He'd sit up on my shoulder and that tail would be touching the ground. That is the oh, biggest yes. reptile I had. And I've had snakes, but it was like ball pythons. Right. You know, I had a lot of king snakes. I, I love a, a ball, of, a but when you're guy. afraid of your own food, what the hell kind of animal are you? <laughs> <laughs> when my wife and I were courting, and she would come over every once in a while and wouldn't tell her that I had reptiles that just ran the house. Because some of them, like my, my iguana, mm -hmm. Slappy, that was tough as shit, you know. I also had a cat, didn't go anywhere near <laughs> Slappy, I, you know. She would run around, she would lay eggs in some of the plants every once in a while. It was just the cutest little thing I loved. But when the wife came, you know, the, the, the animals that run the house and the big snakes that would clear off the... the <laughs> you come home and, you know, the mantle's all on the floor and smashed. And the, everything's smashed. And a, a light is pulled down. And, oh, shit, somebody was active today. <laughs> yes. I loved that. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah, and I've just always been attracted to all the all the weird animals. Now I've also done a lot, and I know it, it's illegal in Indiana, so I would never ever do this again. But you know, I have raised many raccoons. Oh gosh, yes. Possums. Oh yes. Um, did yes. An, an owl, a screech owl. Oh and wow! I you, didn't do the owl. I'm telling you, you you've never seen love until you've had an owl look you eyeball to eyeball. Yeah. And cuddle up. Now, remember, I, yes. I always had my, right. my braided 
Well, I remember I'd come home and I was working midnights then because I do a lot of work outside of Steel Horse. You know, I right. do a lot of construction work, a lot of a lot of remodels. And so when you're remodeling a restaurant, you go in when they close. They got to close by ten yes. o'clock, so we can have it until eight in the morning. Then we have to make it look pretty before you we gotta, leave. Yes, everything's clean. Yeah, so I was doing nice. that, and a lot of that was out of state, so I'd be gone for several days in a row, whatever. But I just remember that little owl man. I'd get home. And after working all night, you know, I'm ready to go to bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. Well, he's an owl. He's mm -hmm. ready to go to bed, too. And I'm, I'd sit in my recliner, and he'd come over there, and I'd just fold my arms like this, and he'd lay in that arm, and he'd grab uh. those beads. And because I always have beads in my mm -hmm. brain, and he'd grab that and he'd just wrap himself up in that stuff and then go, you know, he'd look at me. I, I started to call him Cheech and Chong after yeah. a while. He'd look at me with them big old eyes, then they'd just start getting tired and he'd start getting squinted in his eyes. I was like, my God, he looks so stoned right now. <coughs> And then he'd go to sleep. And the two yeah. of us would sleep for hours right there in the recliner. Yes. It was just, there's something really, really awesome about that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I've gotten in trouble many, many, many times and told many, many, many times I'm not allowed to do that. I, I Right. But it's this my yard. This is Indiana. Is yard. We, we have some really, you know, we still, you can still get away with having lions and tigers and bears in Indiana. You, you know, it's so. Right. A raccoon, a, a, an owl. You know, yeah. there's a lot of them. But you talk about that room, the house. That's the same thing. With yes. That, every piece of furniture was covered in sheets and, and yes. paper and you have whatever. To. And it was just like, you know, because we talked about it. It was like after after he was gone, it was like, you know, I wouldn't mind having one and permit it and all that, you know. And because mm -hmm. there are ways you can you can have one legal. And I was like, oh yeah. And I just remember telling, I was like, man, that was a lot of work. I don't know that I want that. Every, uh, every day for you know, the if, next 50 years. If you go to the Oddities show, if every once in a while the Reptile show, some of the different shows, there's a, a young lady that's got a good size horn owl out there. I think I've seen her at the Reptile show. Is wonderful, yeah. you know, and she's made a career of it. She she makes money off some of her animals, right? You know, but you have to because raising animals is a job. Yeah, you know, if you're going to treat them right and do good by them, it's a job. No. Yeah. Oh, we got rid of all of our animals as soon as our last child moved out of the house. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm on that kick too. I was like that. Uh, hell with that. Everything I have, my blue tongue skink is from our honeymoon. We're coming up on you know our we just had our 27th anniversary. Um, Wally was was a year younger than my daughter. My daughter's 25. My Burmese python, my big Burmese pythons. 32 and, and 29, My everything's, you know, everything's old. I'm right. waiting for it to, you know, finally, right. we're not replacing it. Yeah. 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 But again, you can leave those, for, for, you can take off for a week and you don't have to worry yes. about it. Whereas with a dog or a cat, you can't do that. And that's why as soon as, as, soon as our last child moved out, I was like, Pets we, we got to get the dog. <laughs> the dog's got to eat. feathers. Yeah. Feathers got to eat even more than food. Exactly. Oh, well, no. Exactly. I've had them both. I, I love them, but... <laughs> now, I bet the owl wasn't a screamer like a lot of birds. Birds in the morning right. scream. Right. I've had some really cool parrots and cockatoos and cockatiels and different stuff, and but they scream in the morning. Yeah. No, the owl, the best thing, the most it had was it had this one little kind of a weird sound it would make yeah that after a while it just got annoying it'd be loud me, being around somebody that breathes real heavy you know it doesn't, it doesn't have oh, to be do you have to breathe like that yeah exactly it's like dear god shut up you know or maybe somebody that chews with his mouth yes. open it's like all right i hear you smacking yes but that's and he used to have this just almost like a little whistle sound that was like Dear God, if I didn't love it that much, I would smack this bird in a heartbeat. <laughs> You're going to get a pillow. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, like your other birds, the big parrots and all yes. that stuff. They, they I've loved my birds, them. but I ended up either selling or giving them away just yeah. because, yeah. you know, they live so long and it's just so much care. Yeah, yeah. And they are loud. They are loud. Yes. Man, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know we've gone for quite a while now, and I didn't even mean to get off too much of no, the, okay. the whole reptile thing there. But once again, real quick, your Tuxes and Tennies is... November 23rd. Check out rupertskids.org. You can get online. You can, if you have one of the cards, if you're lucky enough to catch up with me and you got the QR code... Maybe you can get the QR code off of there, right there, zoom in on it. It'll take you right to our website. You can download, get the uh, tickets, get on the list. 
Uh, last year we sold out with a few hundred seats, but this year that was at Mount Comfort RV. Uh, they have since sold, and you know, uh, we're moving over to the casino where we can have 400 seats. Oh, we're not gonna sell out. Get a seat right up until the day now. You know, at events, you got to tell your food request seven days out. So, you know, if you're getting uh, 20 or 30 seats just before Texas and Tandy's, don't expect a lot of food. But, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, so I'll take most, everybody. Now, do, do most people actually wear a tux? Or? Uh, I wear a tux because years ago I ended up buying a darn tux. But, okay. uh, most people do not wear tuxes. And, you know, it used to be we even had a couple tux companies that would give our guys the rentals for 25 bucks. Now, a deal on a tux is 125 bucks, and I don't want to put 10 guys in $125 tuxes, because right. I would never make them pay for that. We always paid for that, but I say just be clean. Clean. <laughs> you can wear nice clothes, wear your Sunday best, that's fine, do whatever. If you've got a suit, maybe, whatever. If you want to wear uh, the, the tuxedo t-shirt, we've had a lot of people show up in those. <laughs> We welcome all. Uh, we've never had to send anybody away because they're too stinky or dirty, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, I recommend to everyone at least be clean. Gotcha. I can be clean. <laughs> there I, you I, go. And we I can, can clean up. I can wear a suit. You know what? Yeah, I, have, yeah. I have to go buy tennis shoes because I don't own. You a don't own tennis shoes, shoes. <laughs> dude. I'm sixty. You have three. slippers. <laughs> Show up in slippers, comfortable footwear. What's your comfortable footwear? Right, slippers. Yeah, well, I just, I just wear these like sketchers. You know, these slippers. Those are mine. They look like slippers, actually. There you but, go. But yeah, I, uh, I, I, I got thinking about it. Don't you spend know. any money. Save your money to give that night. There you go. There you go. Well, Rupert, thank you so much for coming out here, man. This has been a lot of you fun. You are very welcome. Thank you. I love talking to somebody who is excited about what they are doing because so many times you get people that are not and it's like dear god if you want me to be excited about what you're doing get excited yourself you know what i mean and uh and i've seen that in the church a lot yes <laughs> like i don't want what you got yes <laughs> i got my own problems but uh i just appreciate you coming out here man being real and and uh just being being alive I appreciate and, and doing, you letting doing me. what you can do and i we're, I, I'm not quite, I, I know I'm going to be at your tuxes. Okay, place, good. I just don't know how, if we're going to get a table. I'm not sure okay. how we're going to do it yet, but. And for anybody out there that is just a couple or a single or just a few and you don't have the eight, if you still want to buy a table and support us, let us know that you have three or four seats open that you wouldn't, you would like to have one of our employees or, or the employees and their families because we let the employees bring your family, of course, and the participants uh, have a couple plus ones also okay. for moms and dads or, you know, children mm -hmm. or uh, loved ones, you know, uh, uh, significant others. So, you know, there's we have a lot of people that will say, hey, I'm buying a table this year. It's just my wife and I, so fill it up. And, and we'll stick five or six uh, of us at their table. Fantastic. And that gives you a great glimpse also into who we are. Mm -hmm. Because everyone will talk different when I'm not there. Promise. They'll tell you what's going on. And I'm not afraid of it at all. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. They'll tell me. They'll tell some of their, even their secrets that they think I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's a really nice night. And yeah. it's a... It's a night where you're going to see some of our participants with their walls down, their, their guard down. They're, they're there to show people that have supported for years mm -hmm. that they're okay. And now when you say the casino, the one in Shelbyville? Or the, the one in Shelbyville okay, off I on uh, I-70. Uh, I-74. I-74. Yeah. yeah. The horseshoe. They go the horseshoe. Okay. I don't I, know I what guess, they call it out in Anderson. I, and it's yeah. been so many different things. It's the Caesars Casino out in Shelbyville. Right. Okay. I assume yeah. that's what it was, but I thought, well, yes. there is the other one up in Anderson, so I wanted to make sure. Only and because Mount we, Comfort was kind of in between both of those. So. Exactly. And, you know, Mount Comfort, when they were great supporters, they did everything for us, and, you know, it was wonderful. But 
like so many of us, you know, uh, they were getting older, the, the next generation didn't want to keep going, and you saw. Yeah. But, like I say, the, that was the SQ family that ended up selling that dealership. They are the presenting sponsors, as you see on the card, our presenting sponsors yeah. are the same people. It's, it's nice to have year after year people that see what you're doing and are willing to continue mm -hmm. to see value in what you're doing, knowing that, you know, yes, we've created a terrible business plan that just spends money. It doesn't really make money. As we make more money, we increase our program and bring in more services. Mm -hmm. So we never really get ahead. Right. But it's amazing how much you do get ahead when you're empowering someone's life and you're you're breaking those cycles and you're changing the changing the world. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the donors see. Is it is a, a continuing value for your dollar. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. I will let you go, Rupert. Have a great day. Oh, thank you. Thank you.